Alright, hi everyone. Let's get started. So everyone quiet down, please. We'll start with lecture two today. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Anyone have any problems? No, we good? Alright, perfect. So just as a heads up, we're going to be covering a few different topics today. Um, we'll first start with doing an inheritance kind of overview thing. Then we're going to go into talking a little bit about asymptotics, which is what you will be seeing on Friday. And then we're going to go into a little bit of project one kind of like hints. So definitely stay until the end. We'll be talking a lot about how you can um, implement array deck in the end. So let's get started. First announcements. So pre-announcement. This water bottle was left at the project party. So if this is yours, I'll just leave this up here. Feel free to grab it. Um, oh, it's yours? OK. I'll just leave it here. You can grab it after. Or, or OK, perfect. All right, owner has been found. All right, so let's continue on with the rest of the announcements. So first off, happy 4th of July. That is tomorrow. Um, because it's 4th of July, a holiday, we will not be having lab. So don't come to soda. Enjoy your day off. Um, on Friday, we will have a regular lab plus a quiz. So DSP assignments and like when to or like where your quiz will be will be released soon. But just remember regular quiz and lab on Friday. Project one DEX is due on Friday as well. So we had a project party today. Um, there is also another one on Friday. So if you still need help, please come to the project party. We have been releasing worksheets and quizzes. So if anything is incorrectly graded on one of your quizzes, please submit a regrade request. So you should submit these on Gradescope. It should be in like the bottom right hand side of the, the interface. But they're due one week after scores are released. So you will get an email when scores are released. The regrader requests are due by a week after that. All right, so another more exciting event is midterm one, and that is coming up on Monday. So that will be Monday from 6 to 8 PM. More information and room assignments will be released on Piazza, so you can just wait until then to know more about like where you will be sitting for the midterm. Know that you can bring one cheat sheet, so you can start making that um, now if you want to. Labs that day will not be like any assignment, but it will be open up office hours or whatever the TA wants to do that day. So that will be until 5 p.m. So all labs will be going on until 5 p.m. Um, except the Sitar to Diary. All right. So if you have any questions that we are unable to get to, please post your questions on the live thread that's pinned on Piazza. You can also find the slides there as well. All right. Okay. So. Um, we got a few questions about how to study for the exam, so I just wanted to put this here. I think the best way to study for an exam is just to do practice problems. Um, but the most important part is that you don't look at the solution too early. All right, That's a common mistake. I totally make it myself, but make sure that you're really being honest with yourself and doing the problems as if you were on a midterm. So syntax error that you get, make sure to make note of that. Any small error that you make, just make sure that you don't do that on the test. Um, just make sure that you're being really honest when you're doing these um, practice problems that if you need to review something, go ahead and do it. All right, so here are some experiences of your peers. I think these are like Reddit links for what other people do to study, so you can also take a look at those. Oops. All right, so enough of the announcements. Let's actually get started with the content for today. So we'll start by doing an inheritance overview. Um, so let's jump right in. So this past week, we learned a lot about like the relationships that classes can have with each other. Um, last Friday, I believe, we learned a lot about static and dynamic types and interfaces and extends and all that random stuff. So why do we even want these relationships to exist in Java anyways? Um, let's first dive into this random grammar lesson. Um, here are some instructions that if you wanted to wash a poodle, this could be the order in which you do things. So you brush your poodle before a bath, use lukewarm water, talk to your poodle in a calm voice, use poodle shampoo, rinse while I air dry, reward your poodle. Right, that's some possible directions for washing your poodle. If you had a Malamute, you could basically do the same thing, replace all poodles with Malamutes, and it would be the same set of instructions. Right? So we have the same thing replaced in multiple ways. So how can we kind of unite these two ideas together? Um, in natural languages, this concept is called a hypernym. So to deal with this problem, we will use dog. Dog is a hypernym of poodle. So instead of specifically saying poodle or specifically saying Malamute, we can instead replace every instance of poodle or malamute with dog. And we'd get the same idea, but except it's more generalizable to like what we're looking for. All right, so these are hypernyms, hypernyms. Um, we use these to describe these types of relationships. So the opposite relationship is called a hyponym. So poodle is a hyponym of dog, but dog is a hypernym of poodle, malamute, and dachshund. So 
having these words, they comprise a hierarchy of words. So we can see it's visually represented here, but you can see that a dog is a canine. So uh, dog is a hyponym of canine. Canine is a carnivore, carnivore is an animal, and it creates this kind of relationship here. For fun, you can see this WordNet project. It does this basic idea with every single word um, that exists, so you can take a look at that if you're curious. But this idea, it does apply to Java. We want to have these relationships in Java as well. We have, for this project, for example, we have a linked list deck, we have an array deck. These are both clearly some type of deck. So a deck is a hypernym of a linked list deck and array deck. So we can express this in Java in two steps. The first one is we define a reference type for our hypernym, which is deck. And then we will define, or we will specify that the linked list deck and the array deck are both hyponyms of that type. All right, so the first step um, we'll be doing can actually be done in two different ways. So the first way that we'll explore that you've probably seen before is called an interface. So an interface, um, this will specify the capabilities that some class that implements it should have. Right? There's a lot of words on here, but interfaces, if you use an, if something implements an interface, this is going to do what is called interface inheritance. So I don't think this is an actual like very specific like terminology that you'll need to know, but what interface inheritance is, is that an interface is a list of all method signatures. Inheritance is that the subclass will inherit all these um, interfaces are all these method declarations into the class that is being implemented. All right? So just note that when you have an interface, these normally specify what the subclass can do, but not how it's going to be done. All right? So it specifies what behavior it should have, but not how to execute that behavior. So subclasses, if you implement this interface, you will have to override all these methods. Otherwise, you will have a compilation error. So for example, if we had deck, we had an array deck here. If our deck interface looks something like add first and size, and our array deck does not have a size um, method implemented, then we will have a compilation error. Okay. So just some other random notes. All variables and methods are going to be public by default. Um, variables are also static and final. And one class can implement uh, many interfaces. So you're not only limited to one. You can implement like three or four or however many that you want. So we've seen interface inheritance. So just as an overview, it's a subclass that inherits signatures, but not implementation. Right? It's just the method signatures that get brought down to that subclass. But for better or for worse, Java also lets you do implementation inheritance. So in addition to inheriting those signatures, there's also a way to inherit those implementations as well. So in the interface world, this um, implementation inheritance is done by this special word called default. So let's look into a little bit of what that does in uh, our deck.java. So we'll see here, let's say this is our deck interface from the project. We have all these methods that have been defined here. And you could, if you want, if you know the exact behavior that you want to happen, you could make one method default, implement that method, and anything that implements this interface will have access to that method as well. All right, so here, notice that we have the print method. It doesn't really rely on any instance variables here because there are none. Um, but here is a default implementation for this print method. It will be passed down to all the things that implement this interface. Note, don't do this for the project. There are a lot better ways you can implement print, but this is one example of a default method that you can do. All right, so we talked a little bit about interfaces. Now let's move on to the other kind of um, inheritance that we've seen. So when a class is a hyponym of an interface, we use the word implements. But if you want a class to be a hyponym of another class versus an interface, we can use the word extends. So let's say that we have our uh, array deck and our linked list deck, and we want to build this thing called a rotating linked list deck that can perform any operation that a linked list deck can do, but also this one right here called rotate right, which will move the back item to the front. All right, so if we have a 5, 9, 15, 22, after rotating right, we should have something that looks like that. All right, so how can we do this? One way that we can is by having our rotating linked list deck extend the linked list deck class. All right, so remember when we extend, um, rotating linked list deck will inherit 
all members of the linked list deck class. So all instance and static variables, all methods, and all nested classes. Constructors are not inherited, and things with private access are going to be a little bit harder to get, but note that in general, these are the things that are going to be inherited. And this is another type of implementation inheritance that we saw before. Just like with interfaces and default methods, we can do this and also have a type of inter, um, implementation inheritance. And one other thing that we added here that was not present in our linked list deck was this rotate right method. And you can see that with references remove last, add first, these are not defined directly in rotating linked list deck, but they have been grabbed from the linked list and brought down to the rotating linked list deck class. So it has access to that. OK, so to make things a little more interesting, there's also this um, classes can also perform a type of interface inheritance. So this is done with the keyword abstract. So using the keyword abstract, we can actually define a method without providing the implementation in the class. So the class will then become an abstract class. So let's look at this one here. So if we have a shape, um, we have int, color, string, name, int, x, y, position. You can have this move method, which is like a fully regular um, defined method, but you can also make this abstract void draw. So this draw method, you can see it's not implemented. It's declared with this abstract word in front of it. And what this does is it makes this entire class abstract. And any class that extends this shape class will have to override this method and provide its own implementation for it. So it's kind of like what we saw in an interface, where an interface has all the method declarations. Um, this one will also have a method declaration here, but you have to write the abstract in front of it. All right, so here is interface inheritance with classes. So we just learned, like I just went through a whole bunch of stuff and I will just quickly go over um, what I just basically all talked about. So when would you use one over the other? Right? There's a lot of stuff that we just said. So here are just some notes that I thought of. This is not an exhaustive list, but here are just like some of the main points for each of the interfaces and classes. So remember, interface associated with implements, they define rules to be followed, but it doesn't say how to make these rules. Um, all the variables and methods are public by default. They can define default methods. And one class can implement multiple interfaces. On the other hand, when we have a class, remember this is the one that we use with extends. You can define variables, methods, and constructors. State holding variables and methods are inherited when you extend a class. You can leave methods as abstract. And one class can only extend at most another class. All right, so these are the really big um, differences. And then the next question is, what is the difference between classes that can be abstract and interfaces that can use default methods? They pretty much have like the same functionality. And yes, it's, it's now true that with Java 8, interfaces have now gotten the functionality to do default methods. But I think this is the most important takeaway is that remember that when you extend a class, you will inherit all of the state holding variables as well, in addition to all the methods. Interfaces only have static and final variables, so the only variables that one can work with in an interface belong to the class. So it's not like any um, instance variable that you can work with, it only belongs to the class. Lastly, one class can implement many interfaces, but it can only extend at most one class. So just remember to choose wisely if you end up having to decide between these two. Okay, so we learned about interface and implementation inheritance. Remember that, oops, Remember that interface inheritance is what something should be able to do. So it allows you to generalize your code in a very powerful way because you are setting these guidelines for certain classes to follow. Another type of inheritance that we learn is implementation inheritance, aka how we're doing the behavior that is specified. So it allows you to reuse a lot of code because you can inherit from your superclass. You can get things from like your super superclass and stuff like that. Um, and it gives you another way to control the subclasses. You can override things, which is what we'll talk about in a little bit, but you can decide to override stuff if you don't like whatever is up above. Okay, so just remember that both interfaces and classes, they do this interface implementation inheritance stuff, and they both specify what we call is a relationships, not has a relationships. So we can see here that good things are dog implements animal, because dog is an animal, link list deck is a deck, uh, rotating linked list deck is a linked list deck, but bad types of inheritance are things like cat implements claw. You don't say that a cat is a claw. A cat has a claw. So if a cat 
has a claw, you'd much rather have like maybe an instance variable that holds on to that rather than you extending a class that is of type claw. <coughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to stop here for a little bit. Does anybody have any questions about anything we just talked about? Cool. So, I mean, if you do, like, feel free to ask them. There's also the live thread that you can post on, and we'll be able to answer all your questions there. So, um, I'll move on to the, another kind of unrelated topic, which is overriding versus overloading. So, we saw a little bit throughout these previous slides that if a subclass has a method with the exact same signature as a superclass, we will say that the subclass overrides that method. It's a lot of words, but I think it's more clearly displayed here. So, if we have a deck interface with the add last method, array deck if there is another add last method with the exact same signature, this array deck is overriding add last that is found in the deck. All right? So because the signatures are the same, array deck implements deck. We call this array deck overriding add last. So let's look at a few examples. So here we have the animal interface has a public void make noise. We have a pig class which implements animal. We also have a make noise in there. So we can see that pig overrides make noise, right? They're the exact same signature. Pig implements animal. Everything is good. Methods with the same name but actually different signatures are what we call overloaded instead. So let's see an example of that. If we have public class dog implements animal and we have public void make noise that takes in a dog, this method make noise is actually overloaded in this case. Even though the names are exactly the same, there is one difference in it, and that is the difference in the argument. Right? So this is not an example of overriding. This is actually an example of overloading. Um, so make sure to keep this different difference in your mind. Like when you're doing all these static dynamic type problems, this is going to be pretty important when you do that. All right. So here is just another example of overloading in the same class. So we have abs, which is absolute value, takes in an int, and abs that takes in a double. So both of these are like basically overriding or overloading. I'm sorry, overloading each other. They have the same um, method name, but their arguments are different. So that's why this is an example of overloading. OK, and just like a small note, this is not too important that I'll kind of skip over this because we need to get through some of the rest of this stuff. But when you override something, always make sure to add the at override tag. Um, there's reasons why you want to use at override. It just helps you ensure that you're overriding the right thing. So read this on your own time, but definitely at override everything in project one and what you do in the future. OK, so any questions before we move on to static and dynamic types and all casting and weird inheritance problems like that? All right, perfect. So we'll go through this a little bit fast because you've seen this already. Um, but just note that every variable in Java has what we call a static type, which is also known as a compile time type and a dynamic type, which is known as a runtime type. So the reason why they're called this is because that's the, very, or that's the type that is used during each of the phases, during compilation, during runtime. And we'll go into a little bit more of what that means. But just note that the static type, it never changes. And the dynamic type is what changes. That's why it's called a dynamic type. So let's look at a little example. So we have a living thing here, LT1. There's a box drawn here. Its static type is living thing. And currently, dynamic type is null. There's nothing that it points to. When we set LT1 equal to a new fox, what we're doing is that the static type is still the same. But now the dynamic type is what the object actually is on the inside. So what the dynamic type of LT1 is, is a fox. All right, next thing, we set animal A1 equal to LT1. This is a cast over here, which we'll talk about later. But when we do that, we'll have animal A1 Static type is animal. The dynamic type is actually fox here. Even though that we had an animal um, on this side when we assigned it, LT1 truly is a fox. So that is what the dynamic type of animal, of what A1 will be. All right, next line, we're going to instantiate a fox. So we have a new fox here. Dy dynamic type and static type are both fox. But the most interesting thing, I think, happens on this next line when we set LT1 equal to a squid. So when we do that, we can see that LT1 now points to something else, but you can see that the dynamic type has changed. So it was first fox, then the next line is a squid. So this dynamic type is the one that can change. Right, static type never changed through any of this. The thing that can change about a variable is its dynamic type. All right? Okay. So 
Now let's talk about what happens when we try to call something. Like when we try to call a method when we have this kind of strange static dynamic type relationship. So let's say that the compile time type or the static type is x and the runtime type is y. If y overrides the method in x, then y's method is actually used instead. So I know there's a lot of letters, but let's look at this example. This is actually what is called dynamic method selection. So let's say we have this deck, which is S1, which is a new linked list deck. So the static type of um, S1 is a deck, while the dynamic type is a linked list deck. If we add last, add last, add last print, note that inside our linked list deck, we will have to override all these methods. So even though that this is truly an S1, S1 is truly a linked list deck, the compiler will see that it's a deck. All right? But what actually gets run is the dynamic types method, because the dynamic type will be overriding the methods in X or the deck class. So all these add last prints, these aren't using the one that belong to the interface because those aren't even implemented. Which ones that are, the ones that it are using is actually the ones that are linked list tech that you will be implementing. Okay, so let's quickly go through this example, just an example of dynamic method selection and how it works. So I'll go over really quickly what this class is about. So we have an interface, animal. It has a whole bunch of default methods here. Greet that takes in an animal, sniff that takes in an animal, flatter that takes in an animal. And we also have this dog class, this dog class that implements animal. So note that sniff, sniff takes in an animal. So this is an example of overriding, right? Because this sniff takes in an animal, this sniff takes in an animal, but this flatter takes in a dog. So what is it instead? Overloading, yeah, so this one is gonna be called overloading. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this. Flatter is actually overloading the flatter in animal. Okay, so let's start. A, a is an animal, static type is animal, but it's actually a dog. D is static type dog, but it's actually a dog. So when we do a.greet D, what happens is that we'll look in the uh, static type, we'll look in the compile time type and check, is there a greet that takes in D? D, which is a dog. So we'll look inside animal and see, oh, we have a greet right here that takes in an animal. A dog is an animal, so let's try to use this one. So when we actually run this piece of code, we'll actually have hello animal being printed out, right? Because when we start running it, it'll pick this one. All right, let's look at the next one. So we have the same kind of scenario. So we have A, which is an animal. Does the animal class have something that takes in, that is sniff, that takes in a dog? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, so I see a lot of head nodding, which is good. But sniff, there is a sniff inside the animal class which takes in a dog because a dog is an animal. So we'll instead, oh, oh sorry. OK, so let me, let me elaborate on that a little bit. So there is, during compile time, A, we, take, we check if A has a, a sniff that takes in a dog, which it does, sniff animal A. But one thing I forgot to mention is that we will actually use dynamic method selection here. So remember that thing we were talking about before? If there is a method that overrides another method in the superclass, that method is the one that will actually be used. So caught me off guard too, but when we actually run this, remember that A truly on the inside is a dog. So that is a dynamic type. Um, A's dynamic type is a dog, so we'll start with dog and we'll look inside the dog class if it has that method that we're looking for. So we found sniff animal A. When we actually run this, we'll see, we'll start in dog and say, do we have a sniff animal A? And it turns out that we do. So we'll actually end up printing dog sniff animal. All right? Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that? I think I got tripped up a little bit too. So any questions about this? Yeah. Can you say your name? Uh, Sean. John. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So Sean's question was, if inside dog there was a sniff that takes in a dog as well, what will happen? So I'm actually going to hold off on that question because we talk about that a little bit later. So we'll talk about it. Let me know if that doesn't answer it for you. All right, any other ones? Okay, yeah. Is overloading bad? Um, I would say it's generally bad because it's a little bit confusing because you don't really know which method is going to be run. It's really dependent on your argument. 
So I would say that it's bad. Some people might have different opinions about that, but I think it just makes it a little more confusing. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's start with the next one, d.flatterd. So we'll do the same process. D is a dog, right? It says on the, the static type of D is dog, so we'll look inside dog if there is a flatter that takes in a dog. There is this one right here, so we'll actually end up printing you are cool dog here. And here's where it gets a little more interesting, is that we have this animal A, we're trying to call dot flatter on D, which is a dog. So we're going to check inside animal. Is there a flatter that takes in a dog? We'll see that there's a flatter that takes in an animal A. So, okay, let's try to run something like this. But when we actually start running it, remember, the dynamic type is the one that we'll start with. So the dynamic type, we're going to look inside the dynamic type, see if there's a flatter that takes in an animal, which is the one that we found when we compiled, but there's actually none that satisfies that requirement here. There's a flyer that takes in a dog A, but what actually gets printed out in the end is you are cool animal, all right? And that's because we just talked about this earlier, it's kind of spooky, but we remember that flatter is an overloaded method and not an overridden method, right? Dynamic method selection only happens with overridden methods. Flatter, right here, flatter takes in the dog in, in, in dog, but flatter takes in an animal in animal. So these are an example of overloading methods. All right, so why does this happen? Let's kind of flesh out our uh, dynamic method selection algorithm a bit, um, but it's a little bit convoluted here, but let's just try to get through this. So consider the function call foo.bar x1. So foo has a static type t prime, x1 has a static type t1. So foo is t prime, x is t1. During compile time, we will check inside foo's static type, which is t prime, to see if that method exists. The method that we're looking for is bar that handles t1. All right, everyone with me so far? Okay, how about let's just go through this and then you can ask questions after this. So we have foo, which is t prime, x, which is t1. We're going to check inside um, the t prime, which is the type of foo, is there a bar that takes in a t1. If there is, we will actually record the signature of that method and store that as the one that we're going to run. Like we're going to run something that looks like this and nothing else. Okay, and just like the question that was back there, if there are multiple methods that can handle t1, such as um, one that takes in a dog versus one that takes in an animal, the compiler will actually choose the most specific one. So if there's a chance that we could do flatter dog or flatter animal and our object was a dog, we would want to pick flatter dog over flatter animal. All right, so we didn't see this in our previous puzzle, but you can take a look at this exam problem for uh, an example of this. But when we record the signature, when we're running it during dynamic, uh, during the runtime, this is, we're looking for something that overrides this recorded signature only, right? We will not use anything that is overloaded. It has to be something that overrides this recorded signature. Otherwise, we will just use T prime's method. So what happens here is that, remember, a.flatter d, during compile time, we found this method, flatter animal. We wanted to find something that was of type flatter animal, so this is the one that we found. Um, this is the one that we found. And during dynamic type, when we're trying to run something, we go into here first, because that is the dynamic type, and we're going to check if there is something of the exact same uh, signature. Because there is nothing that is of flatter animal, we're going to keep going up and up until we find the one that we found before. So this is the reason why that we ran flatter animal, you are cool animal, instead of the one that was in dog. OK, so any questions about that part? No, there's a lot to, yeah. What if you change your signature by putting in a different variable? Like a different variable name. Say, animal was B. Oh, OK, so the question was, if we had, what if we had done animal D here? Or animal D here? Oh, I see. So if we have um, flatter animal D, so the name of the argument here is different from the argument here. So um, that would be an example of overwriting still because the compiler doesn't really know what the names of anything is. It just looks at what the type is. So um, it should override this method. So flatter would override this flatter. Um, but you can also try this on your own to double check too. So you can implement this and you can try running it and you can see what happens as well. Yeah, great question. 
Okay, so I'm just going to keep moving on. If you have any other questions, please, please post on the live lecture thread. This stuff is really confusing. So if you have any questions, post there. Um, but let's quickly just go into the last part of this, which is just about casting. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about this other list that we have, which is called a vengeful list. So suppose we want to build a linked list deck that remembers all the items that have been destroyed by remove last. So it would also have an additional print lost items method, which prints everything that has been deleted. So it would work something like this. If we had a vengeful list VS1, we add 1, 5, 10, 13. So it would have this total. <coughs> remove last, remove last. They both get deleted. But when we say vs1.printLostItems, we should have 10 and 13 print out. So let's say that we're working with this class. And then we'll see how this is useful a little bit later. OK, so when we're implementing this vengeful uh, list, we want, there's really only two changes that we need to make. We need to override this remove last method so we keep track of the things that we're deleting. And we need to implement this print lost items method that will keep, that will print out all the items that we have uh, deleted. So just as a reminder, remember if we have an overridden method, we will decide what method is called based on the runtime. So if we have inside this box, we have our vengeful list, which is VL. If we set our link list deck, we make a variable called link list deck and point that to the VL. Sorry, let's just say VL. Um, if we do lld.addLast, even though um, even though this is a link list deck and we have the vengeful list as its true type, remember that vengeful list doesn't override add last. It overrides remove last. So this will still be using the link list deck's add last, um, but when we start calling remove last. This is when the vengeful list method will be will be induced. All right. So another thing to note is that when we do LLD dot print lost items, we'll actually receive a compilation error. And this is pretty similar to the reason that we were doing before is that when we're trying to compile something, we look in the static type to see if that method exists. So the static type of LLD is actually uh, linked list deck. So if we actually look inside linked list deck for print lost items, we will not find it there, right? Because print loss items is only a method that is in the vengeful list class. Class. So this will actually result in a compilation error, and this method similarly will do the same thing. And the reason is that LLD is a linked list deck, vengeful list is a vengeful list, so we cannot assign what the compiler thinks is a linked list deck to a vengeful list. All right, so how do we fix this? What is the one thing that we can do to fix this? It's a special word that starts with a C. Casting, perfect. So we're going to go into this. Um, this is just kind of explaining what we just talked about. But casting is the way that we'll fix this problem here. So Java has a special way to specify that compile time type is um, different than what it actually is. So the way that you do that is you put the parentheses in front of it. So for example, the compile time type of LLD is this linked list deck. But once we do this parentheses thing in front of LLD, this compile time type will now become a vengeful list. All right, so this will change the static type temporarily only for this line. Remember, it doesn't change what the actual object is, um, like truly what it is on the inside. It'll only change what the pointer is, like what we think, what the compiler will think that it is. So if we have a linked list deck here that's saved to a new vengeful list, we can actually do this assignment if we make this cast in front of it. So now the compiler will think that this is a vengeful list and we can make this assignment. Similarly, if we were to um, cast this to a vengeful list, we can also print the lost items. OK, so just be careful with casting. Um, you're basically telling the compiler to trust you and not do any of its normal duties of type checking. So it, there is a possibility that some exceptions can occur, especially if you tell it the wrong thing. So just keep that in mind. For example, if you did something like this, linked list deck is equal to a new linked list deck, and you try to cast that to a linked list deck, the compiler will trust you and say, OK, I, I believe you. Like This is probably a vengeful list. But when you actually run it, this is where the problem will happen, is that a linked list deck cannot be cast into a vengeful list. So you'll get some kind of error there. OK, so before we do the last part of this bit, does anyone have any questions about anything that we've talked about yet? Perfect. So the last thing that I have for you is um, just this question here. So we have a little bit of time. So this is just an example that I want you to go through. 
If you click the next slide, you'll see the answer, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, but take like 30 seconds, or I'll give you a minute actually to just go through this problem and see what gets printed out in the end. We have a yell key for you to just submit your answer so we can see what you guys are thinking. So take a minute, do this problem. You can turn to your neighbor and talk about this, but try to figure out what gets printed here. Hi everyone. Okay, sorry to cut you short, but we do want to make time for the rest of the um, the rest of this lecture. So we're actually split half and half between two different answers. So the two answers that it's split between is the Golbi Fagolfa and uh, the Fagolfa twice. So we're stuck between B and D. All right. So let's figure out what actually happens here. So maybe you guys have seen the solution yet already, but what actually gets printed out is the Golbi. Fagolfa. All right, so let's see why this is the case. So we have this new casting that's been introduced here. Remember, casting will only change the static type for that one line. So after that, it's fine. No changes will be made to the bird variable or what the bird variable points to. All right, so just keep that in mind. Um, but the reason why um, big OB gets printed first is because we have this overloading, overriding thing again. When we do bird.goalgatefalcon, bird is of type bird. Um, we're trying to goal gate on a falcon type object, so we're looking for something that satisfies um, goal gate falcon inside the bird class. All right, that's the first thing we do during comp compilation, and inside the bird class, we'll find goal gate bird. Falcon is a bird, so we'll record this signature down. We'll write it down in history, and we're going to run something that looks like this. All right. So when we're actually doing, when we're running this piece of code, bird truly on the inside is a falcon. So remember, we're always going to start with the dynamic type and see if that method is there. So in the dynamic type, we'll see this falcon. Do we have a goal gate that takes in a bird, the one that we recorded from before? No. So we don't have this goal gate bird inside the falcon class. There is a goal gate falcon, but that does not match the signature that we have written down in history. Right? So bird, goal gate bird is the one that we're looking for. We find a goal gate falcon, but that doesn't satisfy it. So we're going to go up into the superclass and run 
the method that's up here. So we'll actually end up printing Bigolbi instead of uh, Fagolfa for that line. All right. And previously, this next line, falcon.golgatefalcon, we will be doing the same thing. So we'll check inside the falcon class if there is something that takes in a type falcon. We'll find this Golgate falcon f here, which is the method that we'll write down in history. Then when we start running it, remember that falcon, falcon's true type is still a falcon. So we're going to start in the dynamic type falcon, find the Golgate falcon f, and print out for Golfa in the end. OK? All right, so I know that was a lot, but does anyone have any questions about this example or anything that we've talked about? Okay, perfect. So if you have any more questions about this, please, please just post. Uh, oh, did you have a question over there? Okay, good question. So the question was, why doesn't this line throw a compilation error? Because bird.golgatefalcon, we're looking for a golgate that takes in a falcon, um, not a golgate that takes in a bird. But what actually happens during compilation is that we find this method golgate bird. It actually still works for this case because a falcon is a bird. So the compilation compiler will accept that we have a golgate that takes in a bird. Bird is a more general falcon, so this line will still work. This line will still satisfy this. Um, this question that it's asking right here. So even though that it says Golgate Falcon, it takes in a falcon, Golgate Bird still satisfies it because bird, a falcon is a bird. So the bird is the superclass of the falcon. Okay. And then when you um, actually run it, it would have, so bird then it realizes it's a falcon, so it would compile the class and say falcon, Golgate, um, falcon, and then it would run something. If it was a falcon, it would be a bird. Yeah, so the question was, or just kind of like, reiterating, um, I think it's a good thing to go over, but what happens is we have written down this method signature because this is the one that we found when we compiled. We found Golgate Bird, so we're going to run something that looks like that and nothing else. When we're actually running this, Bird is actually a falcon, like truly its dynamic type is a falcon. Oops. So we'll do, we'll check in the falcon and see if there's a Golgate Bird. We're checking if there's a Golgate Bird in here, but we only find Golgate Falcon. Because there is no Golgate um, bird in here, we're going to go inside the superclass, find this one, and end up printing the Golby in the end. All right? Does that help? Okay. All right. So I think we'll have to move on to the next one, but if you have any questions, please post on the Piazza thread. Um, otherwise, I'll hand this off to Jackson, and he'll talk a little bit more about what you'll see on Friday. Okay, so can you hear me? Are we good? Yeah? All right, cool. No response? That's enough. All right, so um, now we get it. I mean, obviously, you had a really good time with this super simple and straightforward example, so we're going to move on to something even more simple and straightforward. Um, so we're going to talk about asymptotic analysis, which is something we're going to see on Friday. So if this isn't like super clear to you at first, it's okay. The lab should help explain this, but we're gonna go through this a little fast because there's only so much we can shove in such a smart, uh, small time. But luckily, lab on Friday is three hours long. So um, in 61B and 61BL, um, a lot of the stuff that we're focused on is being able to write efficient programs, right? So this is a quote that we have in the lab that we took from Hilfinger, and I don't actually know where Hilfinger got it from, but an engineer will do for a dime what any fool can do for a dollar. So that's us, we're the engineers, and then everyone else is the fools. And we're going to do things cheaper, and that's why we get hired by big companies, OK? Um, so what's important is that effic efficiencies comes in like two different types, right? So what we've learned so far is that sometimes when you're trying to write code, it takes a while. Because you, know, you haven't learned Java yet, and it's confusing how things like get organized. And when you write a bunch of stuff, when you're panicked, it's hard to tell where things have gone and what different functions do when, you know, inevitably we forget to comment our code. So the first bit of efficiency we learned about is like actual coding programming efficiency. How long it takes you to type out each function. How long it takes you to like read through like specs and other people's code um, eventually. You're not reading other people's code right now. Um, 
and then you know how long it takes you to like actually manipulate the code itself. But then um, most of that cost is actually just like maintaining the code and not like really developing it. Then what we'll do is now that we've gotten a taste of that and we'll continue developing our skills throughout the rest of the course, um, we're going to talk about this next part of the course, which is the actual efficiency of the code itself. So this is the execution cost. So this is like the rest of the course is kind of dedicated to this. I know it's been a week, um, but you know that was the first half. Okay. So now that we're in half two, we're really focused on how long like a given program takes to execute and how much memory it requires. Like that's important. So if you have like two ways to do a task, do you want to take the way that takes more time and space or the way that takes less time and space? Probably depends on if you're getting paid, you know, like salary or like hourly, whatever. Um, so let's just think about like a quick example. So let's say that you're given a sorted array and maybe it contains some duplicates. Um, so the question is like, can we find out if there are any duplicates, right? So we could think of a pretty straightforward approach that we think is gonna work where we can just consider every possible pair and if any of them are duplicates, all right, cool, we found our duplicates, we're good. So what we would do is we'd say, okay, negative one and th or negative three and negative one, are they the same? No, right? So those aren't a duplicate. Let's look at the next pair. We'll take negative three and two. Are those the same? No. Okay, so then we'll take negative three and four, and on and on and on. And then once we're done with the negative three, then we'll go to negative one, say negative one and two. And we'll look and we'll look and we'll look. So this will take a bit of time. Can we think of a better algorithm? Well, we know that this array is sorted, so what if we just looked at each pair of things next to each other and we say, well, since we know it's sorted, any two numbers that are the same have to come after each other. So we'll just look through on one pass and we'll say negative three and negative one, not the same. Negative one and two, not the same. Two and four, not the same. Four and four, they're the same, we're done. You know, you don't have to keep looking any further than you have to. So already we've found a way to do the same, like get, get to the same goal and we have two different ways, one of which has to look through everything and the other one just has to take one pass. Does that make sense how we can get to a goal like faster or slower depending on what method we take? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so. Let's think about how we can like take this idea and make it more like intuitive, right? So for most of this lecture, it's not going to be that intuitive, and then we'll try to arrive at something by the end. Um, so we're going to take the like ideas that we came up with, and we're going to put them into code. So we have dupe one, which looks for duplicates, and it's the first way where it basically looks through everything and compares it to everything else. And then we have dupe two, which kind of just takes one pass and then looks at the pairs. Um, so how do I do this runtime characterization? Thing, right? So we, we're going to use this word runtime a lot, which is pretty much how long does this chunk of code take to run based on something. So we want to like find a way to like tell someone how fast my code is. Because if someone comes up to you and says, hey, how fast can you solve this problem? And you go, really fast. <laughs> they have no idea what that means. Like, I don't know, how fast is really fast? So it's not that helpful. So we're going to try to find a way that's like slightly better. So what we want is some sort of way to characterize it, right? Really fast, that's not like mathematically rigorous. It's simple, it's too simple. But so we're gonna try to find a way that's simple in such a way that it's like easy to arrive at and it's mathematically rigorous in such a way that like if I tell it to you and you tell it to someone else, instead of saying really fast, we'll say something that means the same thing to both of us. And then next we wanna demonstrate why dupe two is better than dupe one. I mean like you understood it from this previous example, like cool, we just had to look through it once versus we had to look through a bunch of stuff. But does that really like explain the superiority? You were like, hey, that one like looks better and therefore, you know, I think it is. You know, not always that helpful. Kind of like saying really fast. So let's think about how we could measure which one's better. So the first thing you can do, I'm talking about runtime, right? What is that run time? So let's think. If someone's running and you want to see how long it takes for them, what do you do? You time them. So let's think about what we would do in code. If you wanted to see how fast one piece of code executed versus another one, what's the first idea you have? I'll just get my watch out or my phone and I'll time it. So you'll take the two pieces of code, you'll plug something into both of them, you'll hit go on the timer and the code at the same time, you say nice, that took x seconds, and then you time the other one, you say nice, that took y seconds, and you say x greater than y or y greater than x. Now you know which one's better, right? Maybe, maybe not. Did you run them on the same machine? Were the same operations happening on that machine? We don't know. There's a lot of factors that could affect that. So um, let's say I did actually do this, and this is what I got for dupe one versus dupe two. So if I took an array and I dumped a bunch of stuff in it, and I, it was of size n, where n is either 10,000 or 50,000 and so on, and I timed the amount of time it took 
um, for dupe one to run versus dupe two to run, this is the chart I got, right? So we have dupe one is where it looks through everything compared to everything else, and then dupe two is where it just kind of like looks through everything once. And this is the graph I get. And from this, you can say, all right, who thinks dupe one is better? And who thinks dupe two is better, right? And why do you say that? You say, well, that one's got smaller numbers, and we want things to happen faster, and smaller is faster, right? Mathematically rigorous, we're good. Not quite. So let's keep thinking about how we can improve on this. We have our chart. We see that one's clearly faster from this, but you know that's just me getting a timer out and hoping that it's going to like actually run at the same time with the same operations. So things that are good about this is it's easy to measure. The meaning's obvious, right? We just hit go, and then we wait for it to stop, and then we hit stop, and we say that's some amount of time. We're good. What's bad is that it can take a lot of time to actually calculate this. Remember, to make this whole graph, we had to time it for each of these data points along this graph. And so I actually had to run it for 400,000 like, length array. right? So I, I had to take the time to do this, which can, which can take a while, especially if I have something that's really slow. So in addition to that, depending on the machine, like, what if I ran, like, we know that, like, we know that dupe 2 is better than dupe 1, but what if I ran dupe 2 on my, like, TI 86, I don't know what calculators there are. What if I ran it on a calculator, but then I ran dupe one on a supercomputer? The supercomputer might finish faster, even though dupe one is clearly inferior. So this has a lot of dependencies, which we kind of want to like figure out how to avoid, because theoretically, you know, you want to say something better than really fast. So let's think of another technique. Instead of just a stopwatch, let's count all the possible operations that can happen for, say, that first input, an array of size 10,000. So this is dupe uh, one here, and we're going to make this table. And we're going to count how many times these operations occur. So at the top, you can see we set i equal to 0, and we have that operation there, and we're going to count how many times does it occur. So if I run this piece of code, how many times does i equal 0 occur? Any ideas? Can you shout it out? 10,000 times? i is set to 0 10,000 times? Did I hear minus 1? That was maybe not. Well, what's going to happen is it's going to happen once, right? You start this outer for loop, i is equal to 0. And then i is never equal to 0 ever again, right? So it's only going to happen once. And then we can like count up how many times each of the other things are going to happen. So here we know that i equals 0 just one time. And then furthermore, we can see like how many times is j set to i plus 1. Well, we know that that line is going to happen at the beginning of the inner loop, and that inner loop is going to happen how many times? However many times the outer loop runs, and the outer loop runs how many times? 10,000, right? So then now we can get that like j can run up to 10,000 times, but what happens if the first two items are duplicates? It's going to run once. We're immediately going to check, oh, those are duplicates. We're done. So it's anywhere between 1 and 10,000 times. Does that kind of make sense? So the inner loop can happen either once because the first items the first two items are duplicates or 10,000 times because we get to the very end before anything's a duplicate or nothing's a duplicate. Yeah? Okay. And now, here's the math that you don't have to think about. How many times do all the other things happen? Let's think. Well, this one's clearly going to be two, between 2 and 50,000, or 50 million, 15,000 and one times. Everyone, yeah, easy, right? And then this one's between 0 and, you know, there's big numbers that you don't really have to think about. But what we can actually do is do these calculations, and we can get these numbers. We can arrive at these numbers. And then these can help us figure out how long things take to run, right? Because if we counted all the possible operations for, say, an array of size 10,000 for dupe 1, and then we calculate for dupe 2, we can calculate, we can see which numbers are bigger or smaller. Kind of like the stopwatch example, but we're counting actual operations. So what's good is that this doesn't really depend on the machine, because each machine has to run every line of this loop. And what's good is that, like, the fact that it was size 10,000 gives us actual raw numbers back out. But what's bad is that like, you have no idea how I arrived at these numbers, and they're not that fun to come up with. And basically, like, why did I choose the number 10,000? It's just a number. If I chose a different number, do we know if those numbers over there are going to be the same? Maybe, maybe not, right? So this doesn't tell me how long things are actually going to take. It just tells me for one like, input, these are some numbers I got back out. So let's try to improve on this. So here, um, let's try to count operations in terms of the size of the input. So before, we just had one input, which was an array of size 10,000. And now let's try to do it where there's some arbitrary length, and we'll calculate it from there. So we know that i is going to be equal to 0 
the same amount of times no matter what, because it just happens once, right? And then we know that this, like over here, we have, um, I guess I have a cursor. That's great. I forgot about that. Um, so we know that like i is going to be set to 0 once in either case. And then over here, we still have the old table. But in the new table, um, we know that the outer loop is going to run n times, because that's like the size of the array. So that's our length over here. So then this inner loop right here is only going to be like initialized n times. So we can just swap out like our 10,000s for n. And then we can try to get like more of a math formula rather than just a number. Does this kind of make sense where we're going with this? Is anyone like super duper lost? Nice. That happens. We'll learn more on Friday. Is anyone like, oh, I'm following? And is anyone like, hey, like, sure? I guess. OK, that's kind of where we're going to be at. That's OK for now. But so um, basically what we want to do is we want to say, like, based on the size of the input that I'm getting, like, can I come up with a number that's calculated based on that so it's not just, you know, some magic number that I've come up with? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, based on the size of the input, can I count how many times certain operations occur? Um, so then when we do this, it's good because not only is it independent of the machine and the, like, size of the input is captured in the model like before, we can see how the algorithm scales. So if I swapped out the number n for any other number besides 10,000, right, I can see like, oh, for an input of this size, this is how many times this operation is going to occur. Or for a number of this size, this is how many times it's going to occur. So it's actually telling me, like, based on what I put in, how much work is going to come out, which tells me kind of how long it's going to take if we know how long each operation is. Um, but again, it's still tedious to compute, especially because before we could just like make a program that like counts how many times the operations happen. Now we have to look at it and do the math ourselves, and like, who really wants to do math? Um, so this doesn't. This still doesn't tell us the actual time. So let's come up with another technique. But first, before we do that, let's take the stuff we applied here, right? These ends, and let's see if we can come up with rest, rough estimates for the other program. So this was Duke one over here. Let's come up with Duke two. So we can like shout out answers if we're like we're gonna try it for the first few things and like then they'll kind of get annoying and we'll move past them. But does anyone know how many times this less than operation is gonna happen roughly if I have like an input of size n or an input of size ten thousand? Any ideas? So we know that this less than happens like how many times do we see less than in the code? Just one time, right? And where does it happen? In this like for loop, and it's part of the condition of the for loop, right? So when we go through a for loop, we like set, we initialize, and then we check the condition, and then we go through the loop, and then we like increment and check the condition again, right? So every time we restart this for loop, we have to check the condition, which involves the that single less than, right? So then how many times are we looping through if I give you like an input of size n? n ish, right? And then how many times are we checking the condition then? n, right? Unless we like short circuit and get to the answer sooner. So like our less than is going to happen like between like one or like one or zero and n times. It's okay to be off than one, off by one in these cases because like it's like we're starting to guesstimate more as we go. But basically, like, does that first argument make sense for the less than? Is that kind of like, OK. And then the rest of them, like the increment is going to happen roughly the same amount of times, because you increment it at the same time of every loop as well. And then the equals is going to happen within the loop every time. And then the amount of array axes is going to be kind of like double those numbers, because you do it twice in the same line. So like, is this starting to kind of make sense, how we're like getting to these numbers like based on the size of the array? Like thumbs up, thumbs down to you? OK. So yeah, we're going to keep going, still a little fast. But now that we have like these two tables filled out, which algorithm do you think is better? Who thinks dupe one is better? And who thinks dupe two is better? All right, and then now we can arrive at a slightly better idea of why, right? Does anyone have like a, a basic like idea for why dupe two might be better? Yeah, and you say linear. And that makes it better because exponentially or quadratically, right? Yeah. So basically, we know like 
from like what we've seen in like other math courses or stuff like that, we've got like lines which grow a certain way, and then we've got parabolas which grow another way. And like that can tell you like as you feed bigger and bigger numbers in, squaring something is going to get a lot bigger than not squaring something. So we can see dupe two is better, and then basically we're getting fewer operations to do the same work, which we can see in that far right column on each. And then the better answer, which we've already arrived at, is that the algorithm scales better as we move forward. So in that like worst case of like having to look through the entire thing, we're getting linear versus quadratic. And then we know that things that are quadratic tend to get bigger than things that are linear. So we just basically say parabolas grow faster than lines. And now we're getting to a nice rigorous explanation, right? Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, zero to n minus one. Oh, because it's you. You like. It's not like super important, but it's like based on like when you check the condition versus when you increment. It's like basically just in the structure of the for loop that you don't really need to think about that much, and also because it's a dot length minus one. Uh, yes and no, but the off by one doesn't really matter a ton here. Like. You can look into the structure of how a for loop works, but it's like, it's not worth your time right now. I can tell you that. OK, any other questions? OK, we'll keep going. Awesome, that's a great idea. OK, so now, um, as we saw before, we didn't want, really want to think about what would happen if like, the first two were duplicates, because then you know either thing is going to take roughly the same amount of time. It's no big deal. Um, because what's important is as we build bigger and bigger projects, we're going to be dealing with bigger and bigger pieces of input. So like if we're doing like simulations of a lot of particles or like we have a lot of transactions or stuff like that, we basically want to see how big numbers are going to like slow us down. So we want things that look like lines versus parabolas because the bigger the number is, the bigger the output's going to be. So the more things we're dealing with, the more we want to get like a, like a lower order asymptotic growth. Uh, does that make sense? Why? Because it's it's faster, basically. And that's what we want. So if we have like two algorithms that zerpify, which is a word that Josh Hug made of, um, a collection of n items, we say zerp1 takes two times n squared operations, and zerp2 has 500 n operations. If like you have really small inputs, you're you're gonna say, okay, like zerp1, this like squared thing, is taking less time to complete than zerp2, which is this linear thing. But as the size that we're looking at grows and grows and grows, we're going to hit this like 250 number here, where all of a sudden that parabolic thing greatly exceeds the linear thing. And we really, really want to be using something that looks more like ZERP2 than ZERP1. Does that kind of make sense? So like in the beginning, you might like trick yourself and think, oh, no, this one is faster for little inputs. But we're not thinking about little inputs as asymptotically. We want big inputs. Cool? OK. So basically the reason why is we have this cool chart here that says, okay, like this is like how long it takes for some like really like powerful processor that can do a lot of work to do certain things. So if you have something that's linear, basically it's pretty fast, but then as you like get to something that's parabolic, like if you have like certain inputs, it's gonna take a lot longer. So for small inputs, these parabolic things aren't like a huge deal, but then as they get a little bigger, all of a sudden you're going from one second to two minutes to three hours every time you like increase by a factor of 10 up to 12 days. So this is like, oh, we really want things that are linear and like we don't really want things that are quadratic. But then if you look at things that are cubic as compared to quadratic, like you think like, oh, we're just multiplying by one more n, no biggie. You go from one second to 18 minutes to 12 days to 32 years to 31,710 years, whereas something that's linear is just a second. So we really want to be aiming stuff that's for uh, aiming for stuff that's faster rather than slower asymptotically. Um, so yeah, moving on from there. So now we've basically gotten to a point where we can demonstrate the superiority of dupe two over dupe one, and we've gotten to a point where it's simple because we're kind of like guesstimating. But it could be simpler and it could be more rigorous. So let's aim for that. Um, so based on these like symbolic counts here, we can try to like hone these into something better using um, this like more information, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at stuff called the worst case order of growth, which is before we were thinking, all right, if we have duplicates in the beginning, whatever, it's really fast. It's going to take a constant amount of time no matter what, because one of the dupes is going to look at the first two items and say they're the same, we're done. And the other one's going to look at the first two items, say they're the same, and we're done. 
Either way, it doesn't matter what the loops look like because the first two items are the same. That doesn't really tell you much because you kind of want to know what it's going to look like if none of them are the same or if like they're really far away because that's when it might take your computer a long time to run. You don't really care if something happens instantly. You care about that where you care about where everything goes wrong. So uh, since we want to like do this, what we'll do is we'll try to like make our like ideas of what like when we said before like something's like a linear function, something's like a parabola, we want to like tighten our definitions of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with only considering the worst case where before we had like these things can happen between 1 and n times or 0 and n squared something times and all that. We're just going to take out that like that easy case, right? We don't care about that easy case because like it's not going to take very long anyway and that's not the part that's going to be slowing us down. So we're only going to look at the worst case here. So this is the first simplification that can help us get like to a better idea of what things look like. Does that kind of make sense? Just look at like where inputs are big and it's going to take us a while to get through stuff. So next what we'll do, uh, or so here's the justification is we only care about the worst case but like eventually we'll see exceptions but um, for the most part we're going to take this chart from having like a range for each thing to just what's the worst case of each thing. Um, now what we'll do is we'll add another simplification but before we do that uh, let's just look at this algorithm here that I've outlined this table for and we have another Yale key so I'll give you like 30 seconds to look at this and try to come up with an idea of like how you think this thing grows. So do you think based on these counts that we see here is it linear, quadratic, cubic, or sextic? So yeah. So that's probably enough time for you to be thinking about it, maybe not enough time to arrive at an answer, but we're going to go ahead and move on and note that this is cubic, right? And so the idea is like, I'm going to say that it looks like cubic because of the following argument. Suppose that each of these operations take a different amount of time. Suppose the less than takes alpha nanoseconds, the greater than takes beta nanoseconds, and the and operation takes gamma uh, nanoseconds then the total time is this whole like formula that we have here. Um, but what's important is that if you do the multiplication through each thing, you get this like alpha 100 n squared term and this beta, or this 2 beta n cubed term and this 500 or 5,000 gamma term. And what we know is that as n gets really, really, really big, cubic functions are going to dominate, like quadratic functions are going to dominate, linear functions are going to dominate um, constant functions, right? So what's important is that like as n gets huge, all the other functions are going to look a lot smaller. Like if n is like 100 billion, then 5,000 times whatever gamma is is going to look really, really, really small compared to that, and you're not even going to notice it. So it's really important to note that like only that really big operation is the one that's going to be like your limiting factor. Um, so as we think about that, we're going to start talking about the next simplification, where um, what we're, we're going to want to do is now that we've decided to drop those like everything that's not the worst case, we're going to choose some operation within this loop and it's going to act as our like proxy for like what we're going to start counting, right? So what we'll do is we have this whole table and we're going to choose increment because on the last one we chose this like n cubed thing because it's like the biggest n. And that's like the one that's going to take the most time. And we don't really need to think about this 5,000 here. So what we'll do is we'll kind of ignore those little ones that happen like very quickly. And we'll just think about the ones that are going to take a long time. So does anyone have an idea as to why I chose increment versus less than equals or the array axes? Or is anyone confused as to why I didn't choose the other ones? Does anyone have any idea what I'm asking? There's the problem. So basically what I want to do is I want to choose some operation where I can now count that operation and see how many times that operation occurs and that's going to help me determine like how long this thing takes overall. So um, I've chosen increment because it's like one of these quadratic terms and it shouldn't matter a ton which one I choose. So I've just arbitrarily chosen increment but it's as long as I've chosen one that's not like i equals 0 or j equals i plus 1 because I know that those are like considerably smaller than like those limiting factor terms. 
So what's important is like you'll learn how to like choose your cost model like more as you go through this, but you have to choose something that like represents that limiting factor that's going to help you like it's going to help you explain why one of these programs takes a long time to run. Okay, so simplification one was only consider the worst case, and then two was we're going to choose some operation to act as our like proxy. So every time we pass that operation, we're going to like count it. Um, so now that we've got those two, we're going to start ignoring the lower order terms. So as you can see, like the size of our table is shrinking as we go. So I've I've isolated increment, and now what I'm going to do is ignore the lower order terms, as you saw on that like yell key before. We're basically saying, look, like something that's like linear isn't going to matter a ton when you have a quadratic term right next to it. So we'll just kind of ignore it because it's like a drop of water in the ocean, right? So what we'll do is we'll kind of cross that out and we'll say now this is just like n squared over 2. And then from there we'll say let's ignore multiplicative constants. And the reason why is because they're another like small like factor that's only going to scale something like in a constant way. It's not going to actually matter based on your input. So because of like all the other terms we've thrown out, let's go ahead and throw these out too. Um, so what this ends up is telling us what something looks like and it's going to end up saying that dupe one looks like n squared based off of like all these simplifications we've made. So first we only consider the worst case, then we pick a representative operation, and then we ignore the lower order terms, and then we ignore multiplicative constants, and that'll like push us toward this like idea called an order of growth, which tells us what some program looks like when it has really large inputs. Does that kind of make sense? Does anyone have any questions about what I went over? Yeah. A multiplicative constant is basically like some number that you're multiplying by your, your input that doesn't rely on your input. So like 2n, the 2 is the multiplicative constant. Or like n over 2, that like 0.5 is the multiplicative constant for n. It's basically something that doesn't vary with regard to your input, but is like multiplied by your input. So it's another thing that we drop in addition to the lower order terms. Other questions? Okay. So these are the simplifications we're going to go through, and these will help us arrive at our orders of growth. Um, so if we have this for dupe 1, let's go through how to like arrive at it for dupe 2. So first, we want to consider only the worst case. So what's the first thing we want to do? We want to get rid of all these like 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, and like ignore all those, right? And then after we've done that, we're going to pick a representative oper uh, operation. So should we pick, pick i equals 0? Yes, no? No, right? Because it's like something small that's only going to happen once and isn't really going to tell us much. Should we pick less than? Maybe. Should we pick increment? Should we pick equals? Should we pick array accesses? Maybe. We have like a few hands for each of those because we're all kind of not really sure. But what we know is that if we look at them, they're all kind of like, we all kind of like look at it and say like, oh, it's got an n in each of them and none of them have like an n squared. So they each seem like they're close to the limiting factor. But so what I'll do is I'll just pick the one that we know is going to run the most. And I'll pick that one. And that's the array accesses. And then we're going to go through the rest of the operations where we're going to drop the lower order terms. So instead of going 2n minus 2, we're going to have just 2n. And then after that, we're going to ignore the multiplicative constants. So we drop the 2 and we just have n. Does that kind of make sense to people? Like thumbs up? Yeah? Thumbs down? A few. OK. It's, hopefully it makes more sense on Friday when we go through the whole lap. Um, but yeah, so that's basically the process you go through to arrive at like what the order of growth at a pro of a program is. Um, so yeah, what, we'll, what we can do is we can construct our whole table, and then we can convert the table using all these steps. But we can also use our simplifications from the outset so we can avoid building the table at all. And that comes with practice. So what you'll want to do is like, You'll only consider the worst case for whatever program you're thinking of. So you won't think of like good, like nice inputs that'll spit things out like earlier than you want. You want to think of like how long it could possibly take. And then you look around in the program for something that might represent it. And then you start dropping the terms until you get it, what you want. So yeah, you can kind of avoid building the table with practice, which you'll get more of on Friday. So yeah, any questions about this? OK. And then I was going to talk about big theta and big O. But you can cover them in lab, so it should be OK. So let's take a like five-ish minute break. Um, and then we'll pick up with Matt's part. Yeah, you get a break today. Isn't that great?
Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's, there's people sleeping. Don't do that.
All right, cool. So let's uh, reconvene and we'll move on to the last part of the lecture. Um, it's pretty cool how far we've come right It's only been like a week and a half and you guys already know so much. You guys already like wrote like a major code base for a project, right? Now you're working on the second one. And like just to think like, you know, what, what, 10 days ago, you guys didn't even know how to write a single line of job and now you can like write many lines, right? So that's pretty cool. Just you wait till the end of the semester, you're going to be able to write so much. Um, but yeah, the week before this class started, I was actually hanging out in San Diego. And it was pretty fun. I went to a place called Tacos El Gordo. Have you guys been there before? Yeah, Tacos de Alba is really good there. Um, and so, you know, you can drive down there. It's only a couple hours down, but what I did was I flew um, because I didn't want to do that drive through like, the stinky part where there's like cows and stuff. But, um, <laughs> But it was crazy because it amazed me because when I flew from here to San Diego and also when I flew from San Diego back up to Oakland, like both times my flight got delayed. And that's just like really weird because it seems like a really routine flight that they do every day. They do like a couple of those every hour, but like it gets delayed, right? And the reason for that is because those airplanes make a lot of stops along the way, right? Like the same aircraft goes to Arizona and then it goes to like Chicago, and then it goes to New York, and then it comes all the way back to San Francisco, right? It does all these hops during the day, and if at any point in time, it kind of like meets a delay, then the whole system comes crashing to the ground, right? And so that's kind of like a problem. Like if there's weather problems on the East Coast, well, you feel it all throughout the system, right? Um, so that's kind of what happens with linked lists, right? So with linked lists, you have to hop from one place in memory to another, right? Um, so let me... Actually, skip ahead to this next diagram here, right? I have a linked list right here. And remember, we talked about box and, box and pointer diagrams last week. Um, what we do here is we allocate a variable to hold our in list, right? And this variable box is holding not an in list itself, but a address to where this in list in instance lives in memory, right? It's a phone number to where our in list lives, right? And similarly, this in list instance has a next field. Right? And this is also a phone number to where the next instance lives. Right? It's not containing the actual instance itself. So in reality, if you have an int list and you have many, many nodes on your int list, all of these instances can be living in different places in your computer. Right? Like one's in New York, one's in San Francisco. Right? And so if you're going to traverse your int list, you might be hopping from one place in memory to another. Right? On the other hand, last week we talked about arrays briefly, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more today. But arrays is kind of like these apartment buildings, right? Like they're all in contiguous blocks of memory. So when you ask to allocate an array, Java is going to give you a block of memory that's all next to each other, and you're not going to hop from one place to another, right? So if you remember, like on week one, on the very first day of lab, like if you were in 277 soda, right, and you're like walking onto you know, the second floor of soda, you saw 271 soda, and you're like, oh, that's not my room, right? And then you walk over to 273, and you're like, Oh, that's weird. Where's 272? I guess this is 273. Well, this ain't my lab either, right? But at that point, you knew I didn't need to go to 275 because I can skip one room and I can keep going to 277, right? So that's kind of how arrays are too. Like, we know that ints, right, are 32 bits. And so Java knows how far apart each of those um, indices are. And so if we're looking for the fourth um, item in our array, we can jump immediately to that position. And so that's why access into an array is really fast. You can just compute how far it needs to jump, and it can jump straight there. And so that's going to take constant time, right? And on the other hand, linked list, it's going to take a little bit longer because even if it wants the fourth item or the 10 millionth item in the list, it's going to have to start from the beginning and it has to jump from one to the next all along, right? And so it's going to have to touch every single node along the way until it gets to the 10 millionth item. 
And so it's going to take linear time to find a specific item in the linked list. Um, so that's pretty important for the project, just to have that understanding of runtime and kind of like the trade-offs between one um, implementation and another. Okay, so let's talk about some basic um, uh, basic ideas with arrays. So this is just in a review from last time, right? So we already talked about the hit list, and we also remember that like you can declare a variable and it'll get you a memory box of 32 bits in the case of an int, right? And for primitives, you can store directly that value inside the memory box, right? Because if you didn't do that, then if you just created a four like somewhere farther out, right? Then you would have a phone number to another number, and that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so that's why primitives are stored directly in the memory box. Yeah, is there a question over there? Yeah. So what are like the pros of uh, linked lists if they're like you have all those things but faster? Yeah, so we're actually so the question was what is the array uh, what is what is the benefit of using a linked list if an array is faster in this situation? Right? So this specific situation we talked about was accessing a particular item, but there are other operations we want to perform as well. So we're going to talk about one in just a couple of slides, so hold on to that, right? But there's trade-offs depending on what type of operations you want to do. Okay, and then the second line here, we made a potato P last time, right? And so, again, what we did was we declared a place to hold our phone number or our address, and we created an instance of potato and pointed straight to that. Okay, and like we just said, an array works by uh, asking Java to give us a contiguous block of memory, right? So here, um, here are a couple of valid ways to create a new array. So in the very first line, we um, are going to say that, oh, this is missing an int x, okay. Aha. Ah. Okay, this is valid. It's not green, but that's too bad. Um, so this is valid now. So on the left-hand side, when we say int square bracket x, that means we're saying we're going to make a place in memory where we can hold an address to an int array. Right? So uh, for example, the second line, we said int square bracket y. We have a box that can hold an address to an int array. Okay. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we are filling the array with our numbers, right? And so for the second line, what we do is we get a contiguous block of memory when we use the keyword new, right? Or in the third case, um, it has the same effect. You don't technically use new, and this is one of the only exceptions in Java where you don't use new and still get um, a new instance created. But in general, when you use the keyword new, you're going to get a new instance of something. And so here we get a new instance of an array with our five items in it, and then we can, just like normal, have a pointer to that instance. Okay, a couple rules for arrays. So first of all, an array is fixed length. So once you ask Java, okay, give me an array that's um, of length five, you can't change your mind later because it already allocated that amount of space. And like maybe the thing next to that is like already used. So you can't just like extend your space by one spot. All right. So Java won't let you do that for arrays. Um, the other thing is that um, all of the boxes need to hold the same type of value, right? So in this case, um, we have an int array, so these are all going to be 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits all the way down, right? You can't have like an int and then a double and something else because a double would be 64 bits, right? And so like part of the reason why accessing to an array is fast is because every single box in that array is of the same size, and that's why we can jump, right? So if there are different sizes, then that wouldn't work. Um, so you have to declare the type of the array, and you can only have that type of thing inside of your array. Um, and also, um, I think you guys noticed already, but um, the index indexing is from zero, so the box with one is actually index zero, and then this last one here is length minus one, which is four. And also to access an item in an array, if the array is called A, you can just use square brackets and type in the number here, and you can access whatever number is inside that index. Okay, so here is um, just like a slide with more syntax things that you can do with an array. I'm not gonna walk through it right now, um, but just know that this slide is here. And you can also click on this visualizer to kind of step through and see like what each of these lines are doing. And perhaps you can, if you like want to do something with an array, you can refer to this slide and try to find the right piece of syntax to do it. Okay, let's talk about circular array decks. Okay, so 
Circular array decks. Why do we want circular array decks? Okay, so in order to answer that question, we have to answer the previous question that was asked over there, which is, what is the benefit of having a linked list set, right? Well, it turns out linked lists are better at insertions and deletions. So think about this. Insertion and deletion, if we want to insert or delete into a linked list, that's pretty easy, actually, because all we have to do is we have to, like, delete or insert whatever node we're going to do, and we just adjust some pointers, right? So this is kind of similar to, like, if you walked around Berkeley, which I'm sure you guys all have at this point, right? There's a lot of construction going on. And when they want to delete the sidewalk, right? When they want to <laughs> delete a sidewalk, they just put a sign there and say, you can't use the sidewalk anymore. And that's all they have to do, right? They don't have to, like, do anything fancy with all the other streets in the city. They just have to delete one sidewalk and put a sign to tell you not to use it anymore. Right, so linked lists are the same way. If you want to delete a node, just take it out and then reassign the next pointer of the previous node to point to the one that comes after it. Right? And that's all you have to do. It doesn't matter if there's 10 million items, you just change that one thing. Okay. But for arrays, it's a little bit different. It's kind of like a game of Tetris, right? So what if I wanted to delete this bottom row in my game of Tetris? Well, then this row has to move here and this row has to move here, right? All the rows need to adjust downwards, right? So in the same way, like in an array, if you want to delete the zeroth item out of the array, well, you're going to have to shift the first item to the zeroth position, the second to the first position, and you've got to slide them all down, right? And that's linear time, so that's no good, right? So this is kind of like a trade-off between linked lists and arrays, right? Linked lists are faster at insertion solutions, whereas arrays are faster at access. Okay, so this is good to know, but we want our array decks to be fast. Um, so how can we have fast insertion and deletions with an array-like structure? Well, we can do this kind of clever design trick. All right, um, so this is just a box important diagram of what I just explained. Okay, so here's the trick. Basically, we make it circular. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So, Trust me for now, just make these two fields, one called next first and one called next last. And these are both ints, which are going to remember where I'm supposed to put my next first item or my next last item. Right? So initially, my array deck is empty and there's nothing in it. But if I make a call to add last with the character A, right? so in this case, my array deck is four characters, then I'm adding last A. So I'm going to look up what is my value of next last before next last was five. Right? So at index 5, I'm going to put that character I'm inserting. Right? And so that's why A goes here. And then I'm going to update my next last to be the one that comes after it, because next time I call next last, I want to add over here. Right? And notice, if I call next first, it's going to go over here. Right? So I'm kind of building my um, array from the middle outwards. OK, so let's add something else. So add last B. Right? So again, add last B is going to put it in the sixth position, because before that operation, next last was six, so I'm going to put the B in the sixth position and then increment next last. Okay, add first C, right? So that pops the C over in four, right? Because before I did this operation, next first was four, and now I'm just going to put the C in the four and then change next first to be three. Okay, and then this is exactly the same, but now we reach a problem, right? So add last D, oh, add last D before. Next last was 7, so I put the D here. And now I'm not sure what to do with next last because I've run out of space on this side. Right? So what I want to do is I want to wrap it around and put my next last item in 0 instead. Okay? Um, and so I can kind of continue it around circularly. And you can achieve this in code by putting this mod right here. So when you compute next last, instead of next last just plus 1, just make it mod the length of this entire items array instead. And that's how you wrap it around. Okay. And so that's how we add last again to E. It was at zero, so it goes around here. So notice like my data is C A B D E, right? So that's how I read it out. And I can add first again. Okay, so how do we remove, right? So remove, what did we just remove? We're removing the first, right? So notice nothing really changed, right? So if I remove first, the first item is the F, so I want to get rid of the F, right? And so all I did from the previous slide to this slide was I just changed next first to three, right? It was two before, and now it's three. Um, but the F is still there, which is fine, because 
all I know right now is that like this f is just disregarded, right? Because the next time I'm going to insert to the front, for example, g, like next first was three, so I'm just going to put my next thing here, right? So it doesn't matter if it was still there, as long as my next first and next last are marking the beginning and the end of my valid like data, it's fine, right? You can think of them as like bookends, right? You know those things that hold up books in the library, yeah. Like, as long as your bookends are in the right place and marking what is valid data, it's fine. Okay. Um, notice also um, that size has been adjusted accordingly as I've done each operation. Okay. Um, oh, one small note here that I skipped, right? So you can leave the thing in there only if it's a primitive, all right? So if it's a primitive, it's okay because um, the character app is 32 bits, but so is just like zeroing it out to like, I don't know, the empty character, right? Um, so it's okay, it doesn't change the amount of memory that's used, but if we're using a non-primitive type in object, right, this would just be a pointer to some object instance, right? And so if I don't null it out once it's deleted, then there's still a reference to that instance, and so I'm still holding on to this whole thing that I just threw away, right? It's still there. So what you want to do is you want to null out this phone number, and now, once that phone number is deleted, nobody cares about this instance anymore, and that instance can be garbage collected. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about that at the very end. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but are there any questions about how this circular array design works? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I'm sharing your questions, so can you just ask on the Jocelyn thread and someone else? <laughs> Sorry, it's a little hard to hear in here. Okay. Cool, let's move on then. Um, so let's talk about resizing the array. So this is another problem we might run into with our array deck. Okay. So what happens when we have filled up everything in our array and we've run out of space, right? Because we said that with arrays, they can't be resized, right? Once you ask for 100 places to put your numbers, like you can't have 101. Java won't give it to you. Well, we can kind of make a design that makes it look like we're resizing our arrays, right? And so that's like our resize procedure. And so here, imagine we have a length 100 array and it's full of our data. Okay, what if I want to add last again with 11? Well, where does it go? Well, we can make the illusion of resizing by um, declaring a new array that is size plus one, so now we have 101 spaces. All right, voila. Now we can copy everything over. Oh, there's two ways to copy. You can use this thing called array copy, and that will, it's a function that copies the stuff from one array to another, so here's the syntax, and you can look into this. Or you could write a loop that does it like with a for loop or something like that, right? So um, I'll let you worry about those implementation details. But anyways, we can copy all of these numbers down here, all right? And now we have this one spot left, right? Our position 101 for our last 11. And now you can slide the 11 over there. And then all we can do is we can say that items, instead of pointing to this old thing, is going to point to this new longer array that we just made. And voila, we've resized the array, and the person calling this function didn't even know it. Bye-bye. Right. Okay, a little tip. When you're writing your resize code, do it in a separate function. So um, here is like kind of the logic we just did on the left-hand side, and this works and it's fine, but you're probably going to have to resize in multiple functions. So I'd highly recommend just extracting out the relevant code and making a resize function that resize to a specific capacity. And then whenever you call add last, like you can just resize if necessary to the appropriate size. OK, I'm um, not going to have you guys do this because we're running low on time, but let's kind of just take a look at this question. All right, so suppose we have an array of size 100. If we call add last two times and we increase the size by one each time, how many memory boxes will we need to create and fill? So the answer is 203, right? And why is that? If you look over here, 
right? This is a single resize. We had to copy, we have to make a new array of size 101, and we had to copy everything over. And if we wanted to add last again, then we have to make another one that's 102 long, and we have to copy all of those over again, right? So that's 200 memory boxes that we had to create and fill. That seems very wasteful. Okay, and this is like an explanation of why, right? So we have three arrays and we have to keep copying them over. Okay, wow, so many animations. Okay, another question. Suppose, this is very similar, suppose we had a size 100 array and we wanted to call last until we had 1,000 items. How many total memory boxes will we need to create and fill? So in the last question, it was 100 and we wanted to go to 102. So that was like 101 plus 102, which got us 203, right? So in this question, it's 101 plus 102 plus 103 plus 104 plus 105, right? All the way to 1,000, right? So it's whatever that summation is. All right, how can we figure out this summation? Well, here's a little trick. Well, so first of all, it's 500,000. Here's a little trick. So let's pretend we're adding from 1 to 1,000, right? What's 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way to 1,000? What is that? Well, we can make a little triangle here. We can say we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, right? All the way to 1,000. What is the area of this triangle? It is half n squared, right? So that would be 1,000 times 1,000 over 2, right? That's about 500,000. All right, so that's kind of like a little math trick you can use. You'll find this very handy on Friday and also on the midterm. Okay, but anyways, this is going to cost 500,000 operations. It's very wasteful. We don't want to do this. Okay, and this is also a graph of like kind of like the effects of this, right? So if we're doing, um, if we're doing this insertion and we're resizing the array every single time, you'll notice we have this curve, right? And as Jackson explained, this is a quadratic curve, and this can get really bad really fast, right? On the other hand, if we have a linked list space approach, this will be a straight line, which is linear, and linear is much better than quadratic. So clearly, we want to get to a more linear solution if possible. So how do we fix this? Well, there's a little bit of a trick. Okay. So what we did right now is we resize by adding a constant factor. So in that last case, we added 1 to make it bigger. It turns out if you multiply instead of add, it's much better. OK, why is that? So here is a little equation. So originally, we had n items in our list, right? So originally, we had 100 as n. That's how many items we had in our list. And when we wanted to resize it, so say you want to resize by adding 10,000 places to your array. So now you have a 10,100 size array, right? Well, that will cost you first n operations in order to copy the original n, the original 100, from the first array to the new array you just made, right? This is going to cost you 100 to copy over your old data. And then it's going to last you 10,000 more insertions that you're allowed to do before you run out of space again. All right, so n plus 10,000, and that's going to be divided over 10,000 calls to insert that you can do. All right, and so if you look at that fraction, it's n plus 10,000 over 10,000. If you simplify it using the analysis rules that Jackson taught you, well, that is going to be in linear time, right? Because n over 10,000, the over 10,000 is constant. We can throw that away. And also 10,000 over 10,000 is 1. That's constant. We can throw that away. So this is going to be in linear time, which is what we just saw, right? So each of those operations is linear. If you're doing n linear operations, that's quadratic, right? That's why it was a quadratic curve. Okay. On the other hand, if you multiply, well, we get n for copying over the old items to the new array, right? And then that's going to last us for n more times because we doubled the size of our array or we tripled. We multiplied by some factor of n, right? So that's going to last us for n or like 2n or 3n more insertions, right? And that's going to be amortized for average over n more calls, right? And so if you simplify this fraction, it's 2n over n, which is 2, which is constant, right? So on average, for this second, uh, second approach, it's going to cost us constant time for each of those n insertions. And so it's going to be a linear time, um, linear time insertion for um, for n insertions. Okay. So that, get, that gets us the graph over here. Okay. 
So we move from the right-hand side to the left-hand side just by switching the plus to a multiply. OK, second performance problem that you'll have to figure out is that what if we insert a large number of items and then we delete most of them, right? Now we have all of this space because we kept resizing up. So you'll have to find a way to resize down as well. Um, I'll let you guys figure that out. But if you wrote a resize function, then hopefully that won't be too hard. OK, one last thing before we go. Let's talk about generics. OK, so in lab, we've been using linked lists that are full of integers, right? But what if we want to store other things in our linked lists, right? And so that's where generics comes in. We can store any kind of data in our, in, uh, in our uh, linked list without having to redefine our class every single time. So syntactically, that looks like this. You would do public class, your uh, class name, and then you do this angle bracket, and you'll put a name of your generic data type over here. And this name could be anything. So here, we chose bleep, blor bleep blorp, right? Um, by convention, it's usually a single capital letter. And I think for this project, we require you to use T so that the auto grader is happy, right? So just use a T here. But in practice, it could be anything. And then if you have a nested class, first of all, um, in the lab, this was a static class. But this can't be static because um, if you're going to access bleep blorp down here, like, and if this class was static, then that would be a reference to a non-static thing from a static context, and that's not allowed. So just delete static from here. And second of all, make sure you do not redeclare this generic type over here, because then you have two bleep blorps, and then it's going to get confused. right? So what you want to do is just delete this, and you can still access this bleep blorp over here, uh, from here, because it's just nested and has access to that. So don't define it twice. Okay. So those are very important, but if you just do that, everything will be OK. When you use your data structure, then you can just declare it like normal, except also indicate with these um, angle brackets what data type you're intending to use. Right? So when you're coding this, you can just imagine replace all the bleep blorps or replace all the t's with integer, and it works exactly the same way. Um, and this is just like a summary of how to do the generics. Uh, one last thing about um, this like deleting primitives versus like objects thing that we were talking about earlier. You basically don't want to have your objects loaded. So, right, so if we have all these objects that are primitives, there are addresses to actual instances. And if these objects are all loitering around after you have removed them, quote unquote, but you didn't null them out, then they're just going to be sitting here. So what you want to do is you actually want to go and null those items out. And so this loitering sign has lost its address. The only guy in the world who ever cares about it doesn't care about it anymore, and it's going to get garbage thrown. Right. So that's what you want to do, because you don't want these things that are removed from the data structure to be still lingering around, because you're going to have memory problems. Right? OK. We are out of time. That is it. So you have lab on Friday, and then we have the midterm on Monday. So we'll see you then. <laughs>